So um, let's just start the conversation. And, you know, I think, Keith, I'm going to start, you know, with a conversation that you and I probably had a year and a half ago um, when you first started. And I think when you landed, I was here as well. And I remember that first day, we're sitting in a cube talking about, you know, your experience at Mesosphere, mine at CoreOS, and, and just really kind of getting into it about, you know, stateful workloads. And, you know, I think the Kubernetes community was really kind of built on kind of stateless workloads. And I remember when I got into it, I was like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? And so, you know, how much has changed over the past year, year and a half of people trying to run databases, you know, not next to Kubernetes, but on Kubernetes itself? Yeah, well, I would even probably take that a step back from that, right? Um, Kubernetes has become the de facto operating system for the cloud, right? Whether that's public cloud or private cloud, um, on-prem or hybrid or, or whatever you're trying to do. Um, the Kubernetes is being used as that common interaction layer with your infrastructure to deploy your apps in a, in a modern cloud native fashion, right? Um, and the first generation of those applications were all stateless to your point, right? They were web servers and content delivery networks, things where if you did have state, the state was static, right? right? And what we've determined is the cloud is really, really good at doing that kind of stuff in general, right? Yep. Whether you're on, on GKE or uh, uh, GCP or um, EC2 or you know, you're in Azure, doesn't really matter. Those systems are designed for that. But fundamentally, we're still running our software on other people's computers, right? That's what the cloud is at the end of the day. And they're, they're not quite as reliable as maybe running your own data center is, right? And so extraction layers like Kubernetes that do scheduling and manage the runtime um, kind of make that experience easier, but it's really hard, traditionally really hard to run a stateful workload and have it be dynamic enough that you could schedule it and have it um, die on one server and then come up on another server and, and still kind of self-heal, right? right. And particularly, it's hard to do that with databases. Um, I think the biggest change between um, where what we were talking about 18 months ago and where the community is now is that now everybody is facing this problem head on, yeah. right? Um, you know, people were using kind of cloud augmented databases as a shim to get you there, right? These are the you know, auroras of the world, which are great pieces of technology and certainly have their, their place, right? Um, but they don't meet all of the, the needs of, particularly if you need to be split across multiple clouds for availability purposes, or you need to be, you need to be hybrid, right? You need to be, you know, maybe you or your company, your organization still has a big on-premise footprint, but you know that you either need to get to the cloud or you want to start by just adding one cloud region and getting experience that way as you're moving in. You can't use Aurora as your database then because you won't have it in your on-prem data centers, right? right. Um, or, you know, if you want to split your, your risk across AWS and um, GCP and Azure because you're concerned that, like, there was a problem a month or so ago where US East 1 went down for... I think four hours or whatnot, there was a, there was a big issue with the DNS routing or something down there um, that took out a bunch of, um, you know, big websites, right? right? If you want to reduce your risk and be spread across multiple cloud providers to make sure that you don't, don't take an outage when a cloud provider takes an outage, you have to have something that's agnostic. Um, now I think everybody's seeing that this is a big problem and we're starting to see um, a number of different companies come up with different solutions to solve for different stateful workloads in Kubernetes. Well, and Keith, I mean, you know, everything you're talking about there, being resilient, being able to scale. I mean, that's exactly why Kubernetes was built in the first place, right? Like to manage these complexities. So, you know, I always contend, you know, why run a database on the side of Kubernetes? Because you're just basically invalidating all that beauty that you just did running Kubernetes, right? And, and, and sure, yeah, that's a little self-serving here. I'm at Cockroach, right? But, but, it's, but it's true, right? I mean, it, that's the weakest link, right? I mean, in any system, that's what's going to hold you back, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's even more fundamental than that, right? Um, if your, state, your stateful layer 
isn't as resilient as your stateless right. layer, it doesn't really matter that you have a super resilient stateless layer because it won't have anything to serve up. Right, exactly. Yeah, like it, it, whether it's a database or it's a file system, you're a CDN and you, you're, 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 um, you're, you're publishing fun and cat videos, right? Like right. If, if your state isn't there, the stateless services that run on top of it don't have anything to do, right? I so you're, you're only as resilient as the least resilient part of your infrastructure. What's the weakest link in the chain? And I think that's going to, Tim, I'm sorry, but I can't even stop. I can't stop. You're over there laughing in this party room over there. Uh, did you want to add something there? I, you know. No, I think, I think you guys are hitting the nail right on the head. I mean, it's, it's been interesting to observe this evolution to Kubernetes, you know, from stateless to stateful. I mean, I, I, I think, and a lot of it has to do, I think, with the complexity of, of Kubernetes, at least in early days, you know, some people were just, it was tough to wrap their head around it. And I think it was all they could do to just port their app layer there. But now, you know, that there, I think in the community, there's grown a, a considerable comfort level with, with Kubernetes in general and the advancements in database technology like Cockroach really make it possible to run things there that you might not have thought to do or wanted to do when you were first getting started. So we're seeing a, you know, just from a, you know, a, a customer perspective, I mean, so much interest in moving in this direction. Right. And I think, you know, I think the introduction of stateful sets, which was what, two or three years ago, Keith, I think when Clayton Coleman first introduced that, Clayton Coleman's a, he's the architect over at Red Hat who's doing some amazing work. He, he was the biggest contributor to Kubernetes up until recently, I think he just told us, right? So. Yeah, I know. He, and you know, we were just, go on, sorry, Keith. He's one of those, he's one of the top five yeah. all time type folks. Yeah, he's absolutely. He's been around and, and, and driving this for so long. And like, I think, you know, when we speak to the Red Hat team, they're just true believers in the database being a key piece of this because that is what's holding some of these kind of higher value workloads from, from moving over. And, you know, finding Cockroach, you know, look, I joined Cockroach because it was a natural fit. It's a distributed system. It's built from the ground up to be distributed. We fit, we, we hit, all of the check marks of what a distributed system is and it fits on top of Kubernetes. We were a descendant of Spanner. Spanner was the Borg, just like Borg is the Kubernetes. And it, you know, it's, so it's, it's just a good fit. And you know, another conversation you and I had too early on Keith was about operators. And I remember internally here at Cockroach, I was like, gosh, you know, we really need an operator. And the team fought us a little bit because our database was so perfectly aligned as a distributed system. You know, it, like the, the the minimal requirements for operator kind of didn't need us for us, but ultimately we ended up building one. And you own a lot of that strategy now, Keith, and and the development of that. And so, you know, why, ultimately, why did we need an operator? So, so there are two kinds of things that you have to keep in mind when you're running any application. Hey, Keith, hey Keith real quickly, um, I think just to make sure everybody understands what an operator is as well. If you could just address that as well, because I want to make sure, like, you know, we don't we don't lose that. You know, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so so an operator is a is a pod or a container that runs on your cluster that manages a piece of software for you. That's that's what it does. It's a software manager. It's it's operations as code, if you will, for Kubernetes. Um, the and we could talk about the design pattern of an operator versus some other design patterns for operations of code as code that are out there. Um, those are those are more uh, academic discussions. Um, the our purpose for building an operator was to make day two operations of CockroachDB as easy as it is, it is to get started yeah. with CockroachDB on Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, so because of our architectural similarities, because um, all of the nodes have uh, exactly the same API interface, they're a common gateway to the, the entire logical database. Um, and also because no pod is so special that we can't survive losing that pod, right? Um, we we run very naturally and very nicely in a in a uh an orchestrated environment like kubernetes right. um the challenge is right um and this is true for everything in kubernetes right um kubernetes makes certain things easier to do in a distributed fashion but because of the way the tooling had to be built to make it work for distributed you also kind of have to build tooling to be able to do what otherwise would be common functions, right? So for us, it's things like scheduling backup and restore, right? So the database can already schedule its own backups, but
but it has to be able to see its backup location. You're not guaranteed that a pod is going to have access to an NFS file system or access to an S3 store um, from inside your Kubernetes cluster. So the operator is going to eventually help us make sure that that pre-configuration is done so that the database can do the last mile stuff that it normally does or uh, rolling upgrades, right? Now, Cockroach DB is a very resilient upgrade policy. Basically, you tell the database you're about to start an upgrade and then you restart one of the no one node at a time um, with the new version of the binary, um, wait till the entire cluster is healthy again, and then run one command that says, hey, I'm done with the upgrade and I wanna finalize, right? But um, in Kubernetes, um, you would have to go and like manually update config files or, and like edit, like edit manifests or stateful sets and do all kinds of things to make that easy. Now the Helm chart did a decent job of that, but, um, but because it doesn't have sophisticated kind of monitoring, there were cases where, um, where it would start restarting the next pod before the previous pod had was fully healthy again, which is something we don't want it to do. So the operator is going to handle rolling upgrades for us, just like it's literally the same code. We moved, we took code from our uh, our managed service offering, Cockroach Cloud, and and open sourced it in the operator specifically to make sure that the upgrade experience for Cockroach DB on Kubernetes was identical to what we do in in our Cockroach Cloud environment, all of which runs in Kubernetes as well. Right? Right. This is this is us, you know, um, as as uh, Tim and my uh, mutual boss's um, favorite saying goes, eating our own caviar. He doesn't. Yeah. So, um, so those are the types of things, the day two operations, making those as, as easy to do as possible in Kubernetes. That's the purpose of us building an operator. It, Keith, you know, so I spurred something in my head a little bit, you know, and I think about us as a, you know, a relational database built for the cloud, transactional consistency. And I think you and I can go on and on about how, you know, Cockroach is right. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do any sort of relational kind of transactional processing, that, that's what we were built for. You know, there are no SQL databases out there. And, you know, I've, I've, I've seen them at KubeCon, right? Like, um, you know, what is it, what's different about us versus those in kind of this distributed environment that, I think people should think about at least, you know, in terms of, you know, I think different workloads require different databases. I, I will always compare that. Like you and I have talked about Cassandra for years and I'm like, dude, like I love, I, I, I still contend like the, the pandemic would suck if we didn't have Cassandra, right? Like all the streaming, everything is like, you know, it's, it's really powerful. And so, you know, in the context of Kubernetes though, you know, what, what are the things you're thinking about when people are choosing this for different workloads? No SQL kind of thing versus us, you know. Yeah, so so there are certain there's some exceptions to every everything I'm about to say here, but in general, the no SQL databases were built without considering how you might orchestrate them at massive scale, right? So Cassandra's a great example. So the um, architecturally, you know, you take the SQL interface part of it out. The big difference between the way Cassandra stores and manages data versus the way Cockroach DB manage stores and manages data is Cassandra does hash-based partitioning, which is a prescriptive, based on the key and the number of nodes, you can predict exactly which node a particular um, key is going to be on, but, um, but the keys aren't stored in order. So it's not good for range scans, but it's really good for single record lookups, like blazing fast sub millisecond reads for for a single record um, at, at your best case. Um, whereas we do a two level indexing scheme, our, um, our chunks of the key space are ordered. So we can very efficiently do range scans, but every time we go to query a particular record, we have to check the master index of the key space to figure out what chunk of what node has that chunk of data that has that key in it, right? So, um, so there's an inherent ineff inefficiency there that allows us to do more um, interesting workloads. And the impact is a couple of milliseconds, right? Our best case read scenario is like two milliseconds as opposed to, you know, what was it? 800 microseconds or, right. or whatever it is, right. you know, like eight tenths of a millisecond. Um, the, um, 
and for certain use cases, that's really important, right? They, you know, um, but the thing to keep in mind, hash-based partitioning, because it's prescriptive, um, creates certain orchestration challenges in something like Kubernetes, because if the number of pods is a dynamic, the number of pods that's available in the cluster at any given time is not, isn't always exactly the same, and they're not always exactly in the same place. Um, getting to, um, actually retrieving a record becomes a little bit more challenging. Now, there's a lot of work that's been done in the Cassandra ecosystem to make Cassandra work in an orchestrated space. I don't want to say that Cassandra doesn't work. It certainly does. Um, as a matter of fact, it's the first database I ever used in a container orchestration platform yeah. was Cassandra, but it is harder to use and maintain than CockroachDB is just because it was designed five years before anybody was thinking about container orchestration, right? Yeah. Go on, sorry, Fitz. Go on, please. Well, I, I, we could kind of pull apart each and every one of the databases, and including CockroachDB, and I could tell you what it's really good at and why it's not great at certain use cases. I, I think the reality is there, there's this new wave coming. Some of these applications are, like Cassandra, I think are close enough to be considered cloud native databases, particularly if, if um, there's the appropriate amount of investment in an, in an operator, right? Um, some of them, I think we're going to see um, the same thing we're seeing in the distributed SQL space. I think there's certain things, particularly around document databases, where either Mongo is gonna come up with a, like a refactoring of their application that's easier to operate in, in an orchestrated environment or a competitor is gonna come in with uh, you know, a compatible interface, but a different architecture underneath um, that, um, that is gonna run more naturally on Kubernetes, right? And, but the reality is, is that we need all of those different types of databases to be able to meet the different workloads that we want to run in Kubernetes going forward. And I think that's the, I think that's the key thing here, Keith. It's um, the key thing, Keith. Um, it's, uh, you know, the right workload for the right problem, right? And I think, you know, also the right level of experience, you know, do you want to be configuring Cassandra? I always say, and I joke, but it takes a PhD to actually configure, configure Cassandra well, right? If you're a developer, well, just deploy a simple database like ours and you kind of get pretty good. You get, you, you know what I mean, from a performance, but you also get a whole bunch of other real benefits here. And I think one of those things is being able to tie data to a location, um, that that kind of you know a key differentiator for what we do. Now you can do it in others, but, but we really make it simple. And I'm I'm kind of excited where we're going there. One of the questions that just came up in chat, Keith, was about how do you move data from cluster to cluster? And, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna extend it a little bit to like how do you not move data between clusters but still run a single logical database, right? Because I think that's where things get really interesting because you know multi cluster management, be it upbound or what was the other one the cross plane project? What was the other project you were talking about yesterday, Keith? So, um, so there are a couple of different areas where, where this gets really interesting. Um, I tend to look at it more as a networking problem, actually. Right. So there, there are two projects that I've been paying a lot of attention to. One is Submariner or Submariner. Um, the other is something called Scupper. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Submariner is an L3 over L or L2 over L3 solution. So it's like a it's a omnidirectional VPN between Kubernetes clusters, right? Um, uh, which allows you to do kind of low level packet routing um, between Kubernetes clusters. And, um, and then all you really need to do there is, is then have some service discovery mechanism so that services can see each other um, between the clusters and you're, you're kind of off, off and running, right? right. Um, Scupper is a, is an L3 over L7, which is TCP over HTTP um, type of solution. A little less performant, but it doesn't require the elevated permissions that setting up a VPN would. So a developer potentially could set up Scupper, whereas you know an admin would need to set up uh, Submariner. Um, the what's really interesting there is that it handles the service discovery for you, so it includes proxies that um, that basically make it so that all of the pods, the um, local pods routing to all the remote pods in your other Kubernetes clusters, your OpenShift clusters or you know, right. whatever, um, um, have a local proxy endpoint. So you don't have to do any kind of really 
um, uh, kind of uh, secondary service discovery. Um, the those are really neat, right? right. Um, yeah. And you know we're getting to the spot where um, and, and there are a couple of patterns, and I, I don't know which one's going to win yet, but um, for for having kind of a logic like a developer API for effective serverless stateful applications, like where I don't have to care about what server the stuff is launched on, you know, I can I can um, submit a workload to an API and have it potentially be launched across, you know, three different regions in three different cloud providers all running Kubernetes under the covers. Like we're getting close to that kind of a nirvana. I, I think we're going to see it at some point in the next two to three years. Um, there are a couple of patterns to my to the my earlier comment that they could end up winning out. I don't you know necessarily want to bet one way or the other. Um, but it's really exciting to see the evolution in this space and, and yeah. how the 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 ecosystem is is moving in that direction. Well, I'm just, I'm excited to see how fast it's moving, Keith, because I think this is the ultimate vision of what we all saw, right? Like years ago. Um, but in reality, as you said, it's a networking problem. It's a security problem, right? Like I think these are the, these are the tough challenges that are going to happen. You know, can we solve the data problem at the top level and maybe tie data to a cluster or allow, you know, cockroach to start moving data around? Yeah, we could do that. Like, we, we have to solve the underlying infrastructure pieces. And I think we've come a long way as a community. Um, and I think, it, I think I'm really excited. I, I didn't know about Scuffer. And I was kind of, I went and looked at it last night. It's Keith, it's, it's a really, it's really cool stuff. I'm, I'm not a networking geek by any means. Uh, God, oh man, you know. But I think there's like, you know, you work with Calico, you work with some of the projects that are a bit more kind of mature, you, you know, and I think there's a, it's, it's coalescing pretty well right now, which is kind of cool. Um, which leads to another question was in the chat. I want to get to the demo, Keith, but I just wanted to hit one more thing before we moved on from the networking side. And you, we can come back to it as well. You know, somebody was asking about, you know, cockroach and storage and how does that work, you know, um, because, you know, we are a single binary running in a pod and every binary is the same. Somebody else was asking how we're different than TidyB. We, we have one binary. We don't have transaction nodes and storage nodes and that complexity. Um, you know, we are a one single binary. But, but within each pod, how, how, what do you do in terms of connecting to storage? What is the persistent storage layer that we use, Keith? And then how does that work? Let me just ask the second part of it, which is like, then how does that work with stateful sets? Because I think it's a key piece of that, right? Yeah, so from a storage perspective, we want a block store, right? We want a file system to be presented to the database binary. Um, okay. You know, we don't really care what that file system is, whether... Um, you kind of want it to be durable, so you probably aren't going to want to use the ephemeral SSD in the cloud. Although you can, um, there, um, you probably want to have the database manage more replicas in that scenario because, you know, that's a bit riskier of a of a of a configuration. Yeah. Um, other than that, we have IOPS per vCPU requirements, right? We need a minimum of like 500 IOPS per vCPU, preferably as we'll use as many IOPS as we can get. Um, but that's, you know, that's pretty much it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what we don't want to use is we don't want to use a shared everything storage layer underneath a shared nothing database. So, so Cockroach DB manages the data distribution. So what we don't want to do is like, you know, like, have all the pods share the same Ceph FS cluster. Right. Uh, because if Ceph goes down, then you're going to take down the entire database, regardless right. of how well distributed the database is. Um, there are also some, you know, very specific database -y type requirements around, um, you know, how we flush things to disk and that performance. Um, the, all of the, the default volume types like EBS, for example, all meet our performance requirements. So yeah. if you're in the cloud, you want to use EBS volumes, you know, IO2 type volumes should be good to go. Um, we provide guidance in our docs as to like what kind of configurations we recommend um, for different types of workloads um, and how you would scale that up as you need to scale the cluster, right? right. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the only times people have problems with us from a storage perspective is when they 
uh, I'll, I'll describe it as try to get cute, right? Um, so um, as far as how that works with stateful sets, so stateful sets um, are what bind the persistent volume and the persistent volume via persistent volume claim to the pod. So if we have to restart the pod, the stateful set is what effectively kind of helps tie all these pieces together. So the stateful set is what starts the pod and then connects it to the persistent volume claim, which then mounts the persistent volume. Right. So if you're in like AWS, that means that if you, let's say you lost a pod host and AWS spun up a new one, that's the thing that actually um, connects the, the volume that was being stored in EBS back into the pod so that the database can come back up without its right. data. Um, CockroachDB can recover even if that doesn't happen, right? As long as we haven't lost right. a quorum of the replicas of any particular range of data, the database can self-heal even if, if we were to say lose that persistent volume entirely. So let's say you did decide to use um, the ephemeral storage, right? And you lost the node and it, or it got restarted on you because AWS bounced to rack because that's what they do sometimes for upgrades. Um, the, the database will self heal. It just won't, um, we're going to have to re-replicate the data. So there's going to be a more, there's going to be a, the, the window of, um, of the performance hit that you're going to take is going to be greater because we're going to have to re-replicate all the the data back to that node that, that it had previously. Yeah, and I think that's really cool. Hey, I think two things stood out, Keith, and it's like, hey, we don't have an opinionated view of you, what you want to do with storage. We have recommendations, and I think, you know, I, I, I will say this every time, our docs do a great job of going through all this stuff. So if anybody is interested in like deeper level understanding how this works, go to our docs and check it out because I think Jesse and team do a phenomenal job kind of explaining these things. But I think the other thing is, is really critical. It's, you know, when you when you implement a distributed database, one of those key questions you have to ask yourself is beyond the logical model, what's the physical model? What do you want to survive? How fast do you want data wear? And I think some of the things that you're going to see coming out of Cockroach over the next, you know, oh gosh, what guys, in a couple months, like the simplicity at which we're going to make it so that you can just choose what you want to survive, a disk, a rack, an AZ, a region, right? Based on each table, like, and how that, I think that's the stuff, like, I'm most excited about that stuff, you know, just, just driving that simplicity. So, um, you know, I want to, Keith, you want to just do a quick demo of uh, operator stuff or, you know, did you, do, do you have anything else you wanted to add there? I don't want to like control. No, let's, kind let's of kind of jump into the demo. Yeah. It's um, yeah. pretty straightforward. I don't have a whole lot set up today. Um, right. I'm going to show uh, the demo running on OpenShift mainly because it's got a GUI. So I don't have to make you watch me actually type stuff into the CLI. Um, this, you know, this exact same experience, but using kubectl on, on GCP. And we have great docs on how to do that. And um, Keith, while you're getting the setup, I just, you know, Jim, you wanted me to say hi, like, hi, but I, <laughs> I'm, um, I, I'm furiously typing away the answers to these questions that are coming in QA. So I'd encourage people, if you have questions, keep sending them in QA. I'm trying my best to, to keep up with the answers. Some will do live, but, but do keep the questions coming. I'm trying to be good about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a question that needs to be just thrown out. Like it's a good one for the audience, you know, just please feel free to jump in. So that's great. I've been trying to look for them. So sorry, Keith, go on. No, pro not a problem. So I created a namespace or an open shift parlance. They call them projects. It's the same thing, right? Uh, called CockroachDB. Um, I went into the GUI search for Roach. Um, we've got our three tiles here. I'm going to, I'm going to install the certified tile, not the one that's based off of our Helm chart. Um, you can see that it's a level three operator, which just means that um, it does upgrades and it does some lifecycle management work for us. Um, we're still making enhancements to the life the lifecycle management piece of it. So, um, as you can see, this is a one dot. This is a one dot install. I'm right. going to install the the stable channel. I'm going to install it into the Cockroach DB namespace, and I'm going to click install, and that. That is going to install the operator itself, okay? Um, so the operator being a pod that then launches and manages CockroachDB clusters for us, right? So I can jump into here, click create on create an instance. Um, my uh, and Keith, the 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 resilience of that particular pod is just controlled by Kubernetes. That thing's going to be state. It's going to stay just because. 
what etcd just has an instance of the cockroach db operator pod up and running correct yeah the operator itself is stateless right it's right. got um it's got annotations in the pod so that like it knows if if the operator pod itself needs to be restarted it knows what resources it should be managing after it restarts okay. Um, but we're not like mounting a PV into it and storing things to a file system, right? All that's right. just being stored as config directly in etcd, right? And that, I mean, that's normal operating procedure for an operator because yes. it's basically a task-based stateless type thing, right? So if anybody's building an operator, I think that's one of those critical components. Like you, you really don't want state in an operator, correct? I mean, you, you want to manage state perhaps within other pods with an operator, but is that is that a kind of a a pattern that you see across operators, Keith? That that's that's a good way of describing it. Yeah, right. Um, you know, there there's a there's a small amount of state that needs to be maintained, but it's not file system state. Exactly. Right? It's configuration state. All right. Cool. So um, so by default, we have an example here that's going to do use a self-signed certificate to create a encrypted three-node cockroach DB cluster. Um, there's a bunch of different options we could add here. I could change my default ports. I can change my default image. I can edit it and from the YAML perspective. In this case, I'm going to start three pods. Each one will have 10 gigs of storage. I'm just going to use pre-provisioned um, um, PVs that um, in my little development environment. Um, you could use a storage class here to auto-provision. There's a bunch of options here. This is a pretty simple config, right? And I click on the create button and that's gonna go ahead and launch a three node cockroach DB environment for me. Um, so what the operator is going to do um, is the first thing it's going to do is it is going to define the configuration um, and then it is going to start launching pods. So, um, so you can see we've got uh, an example here. Um, we're gonna start. We're gonna start seeing resources. Here we go. Resources get defined. Yep. Um, then um, we're gonna the stateful sets get defined. The stateful set is what create sets up the persistent volume claim. So the first one for the first volume got created. You can see that my um, my volumes are bigger than what I asked for. That's because all of my PVs were defaulted to 100 gigs because um, <clears throat> I have a bunch of 100 gig volumes. They're getting bound to individual pods or they're getting bound to individual um, stateful sets, which are then getting bound to individual pods, right? Yeah. Um, and then um, the first node starts up and then once it gets to healthy and it says that it's, um, Healthy, we'll start with the second pod. Second pod starts up a lot faster than the first pod because um, this is a one node cluster. And so I've already downloaded the cockroach DB image. Um, and then once the last pod starts, the database um, will get initialized by the operator, which is a declarative statement saying, hey, our initial config is complete. Finalize this config. And um, then you're kind of up and running. Okay. Hey Keith, while yeah. uh, while this is running, so there was a good question, and I, and I believe I answered it correctly. But you know, hey, you are head of Kubernetes here at Cockroach, <laughs> so I'll I'll give this uh, to you. We're showing OpenShift right now, but can you talk about kind of the other target uh, Kubernetes flavors uh, for the operator? You know, both now and in the future. Yeah. So um, so right now um, we are focusing on OpenShift and GKE. Those are the two um, platforms that are um, are, are most requested. Um, we, uh, will probably, um, follow with EKS shortly thereafter. Um, but there's no specific time commitment on that because we're working right now on kind of taking the beta label off of the operator in general. So the work that myself and the, the, the greater Kubernetes operator team at, at Cockroach Labs has been working on is, um, is observability. Yeah. Things, right? So this is like making sure that all the logging levels are set properly, both for the database and the operator, making sure that we're able to tie that into monitoring tools, making sure that, you know, um, 
we can configure the backup options for the database the way we want it to. Those, those types of things, basically, um, on the off chance that a customer gets themselves in, self into trouble, we have enough information to diagnose and solve their, their problems, right? Well, you'll be pleased to know that I got this question right for Lynn who asked. So thank you, Lynn, for the question. Well, I think it's a, it's a really important question too, as well, Tim, right? Because if you, if, you know, Kubernetes is this open source wonderful thing, that's all great, but like, honestly, it's going to run on hardware and it's different in every environment, right? Like GK is different than AWS, which is different than how OpenShift is going to manage these things. And I, you know, one of the reasons I think we work with the OpenShift team pretty well, Keith, this does divorce a little bit of that complexity. Is that, I mean, is that kind of one of the benefits of why you would actually use OpenShift in this, in this context? Um, let's pause the questions. Let me finish the demo and then we can get back to that if that's okay. Oh my God. I, it was a good wow. question, dude. I'm, wow. I'm not saying it's a bad question. <laughs> so harsh. I know. Um, but um, I can't talk and type at the same time. And so I really wasn't That's listening cool. to you. It's cool. Um, the, um, I got to get my configuration parameter right. Um, I think it's cert and not cert stir. I always mess that up. Me too. All right. Um, create user roach with password equals roach well there we go um so i just um i use the terminal um so because every binary in cockroach db is include um is in completely encapsulates all functions you might need to run the database including including the cli i um use the web-based terminal for one of the pods to launch a SQL terminal into the database, create a, create a user to allow me to log in. Um, so now I can see the cluster. Yeah. See, it's been up for four minutes. Um, we're running version 20.1.5 here, just because that was the default version that I have set up in the operator right now. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to kill one of the pods. Um, so um, real quickly, I'm just going to go ahead and delete um, CRDB-TLS-Example1. Um, now, the database is going to continue to run. You're going to see it went suspect immediately because it's no longer responding to heartbeat. Um, as soon as it's done terminating, um, the stateful set is going to create it for us again because the operator is going to say, hey, that's not right. So it's already started back up again. It's not quite ready yet. You can take a look at the logs. It's getting itself caught up to the rest of the cluster. So if there's no load going on, there really isn't a whole lot of catch up to do. Um, I don't have a load generator baked into this uh -huh. test. And now the node is back up and running, right? That was as close to pulling the rug out from under this demo as I could do in three minutes. Um, I've done similar demos where I've deleted and like I've had a one cockroach DB cluster spun across say three namespaces in a cockroach in a Kubernetes environment. I deleted the entire namespace, including all of the stateful sets um, and all the PVs, and then recreated it and shown that the database could come back to healthy again. But um, this particular config can survive any arbitrary pod failing without taking an outage. So we didn't even see a blip in in the database actually operating while I took a node out. Um, and, and if, if there was workload here, what we would have seen in the metrics tab is like, yes, there is a impact in queries per second, but but spread out across two nodes and it would just instantly rebound because Kubernetes brought back the pod. So you'd see this little dip, but nothing would ever go out, right? Like you would always have access. Yeah, the, the only yeah. exception to that is that um, any in-flight queries that were being um, that were being coordinated by the node that failed right. would have to be restarted. the The database will um, will will do that as much as is possible. But if the client was actually connected to that node that I just ripped out from under it, the application would have to reconnect to the Re cluster, that and then retry the query. That that's that's the only exception that I'd have to that. That's not any different than any other system though, right? Um, right, I mean, that's just a timeout of a query and it would just reconnect and what, you yeah, right. So, and then Keith, I wanna come back to actually the other question because you do have such good experience actually building this operator. 
um, looking at it from the different platforms, you know, I think one of the reasons we, you know, I think OpenShift is great for us because it does kind of divorce some of the complexity of the various different kind of flavors underneath of, of Kubernetes or like, not, not of the Kubernetes, but of the, the hardware, right? Like, because OpenShift is kind of built to be deployed on at Rosa, like on AWS or on GCP, right? right? So, you know, when people are building operators, and I think there's a lot of people looking into that, like, do I need one? You know, how, how you know, what is that complexity? I mean, how complex is it to build a different one for each environment, right? Like, it's a, uh, it seems like, you know, we, we spend a fair amount of time doing so, right? Yeah, well, and this is the one spot where I think the Kubernetes eco, like the, the greater Kubernetes community could do a better job. Um, the Kubernetes has become a little bit fractured in yeah. that um, 90% of it's the same, and but the 10% that's different um, can be can be kind of painful. Yeah. There, there are good reasons that people have made the decisions they've made about the various distributions of Kubernetes, um, but it does make it a lot more challenging um, to, to build and manage a, a Kubernetes operator, like even one for CockroachDB, which is you know, generally going to be as close an architectural fit to Kubernetes as you're going to find for a stateful application, right? Um, it, it, it's been one of the bigger challenges is managing the differences between, I'll, I'll use the two platforms that, that we're targeting for our initial GA release, the operator, GKE and OpenShift. GKE's security model is very permissive by default. And OpenShift is not permissive by default. Right. It's locked down by default. Um, you can make good arguments as to why you would make those decisions one way or the other. Um, but the, the side effect is that we, um, we have to pay very close attention to what will work in both environments. If it won't work in both environments, how are we going to manage how are we going to manage that? We we went down a, a feature flag route for managing um, distribution specific capabilities. If you're not familiar with feature flags, it yeah. allows you to do like one a one binary deployment and then um, have like runtime flags that determine you know which platform you um, features you want to have turned on and turned off. Um, there's some great companies that that are that are customers and, and partners of ours that that do this. I won't. I'm not going to, I won't we'll plug them on this webinar, but um, that's the strategy that we've been using um, recently yeah. to, to help mitigate those, those complexities. Um, yeah. I, I certainly wouldn't want to be like a legacy RDBMS vendor trying to build an operator on Kubernetes and having to deal with the, like the impedance mismatch of a legacy architecture on top of a cloud native architecture plus then figuring out how to manage for the different distributions of the of kubernetes under the covers yeah. those, those are those are big challenges right those that's the reason why we don't see nearly as many production grade kubernetes operators for stateful applications as i think we would like to see yeah, right? it's, it's intriguing to me just oh i'll come right to that tim it's intriguing to me because i think it's a community thing that's going to have to be sorted out right keith it's like it's almost like we need docker for operators or something you know so like something to simplify this whole thing so um tim you i i, I know you were looking at a lot of the questions and there yeah. were that came in did you want to um yeah there, there there's so so first of all are we giving away coffee mugs because this lin zoo is uh, he's all over it and asking great questions uh, uh and i wanted to answer at least your first one i didn't but, i i don't have them on this one i think we all right a lot of water bottles but jp i'm sure can help get t-shirts and stuff that, so. that's fine but um the, brian earlier asked something as you were going through the demo you know is, is there a way through the operator or, or you know other kubernetes mechanisms to declaratively define databases and um users I mean, I, I, you know, I know there's ways we do it kind of in a sidecar, but, it, it, you know, can you do that um, a, as part of the operator? Um, the operator is not the place for that type of work, in my opinion. Um, not because it wouldn't be cool to do it, but it would be sort of like us building a sport, a race car engine, because it's all written in Golang to do something we could do yeah. pretty easily with like a terraform plugin terraform module kind of a thing um we we are talking 
we do have some plans this year that that aren't committed to yet around um, providing that level of functionality either via Terraform or via another infrastructure as code kind of a platform because it's a common request. One of the great things is because we're Postgres API compatible from a database perspective, a lot of the tooling that already exists to do this in Postgres today um, already almost works for CockroachDB. Um, we have a bunch of customers using the, the you know, the, the, a slight, some slightly modified version of the, the Postgres Terraform module to, to do this exact thing. And they, they haven't, they haven't thrown up their arms in frustration and run away yet. So um, the reason we haven't already built it is because the Postgres, um, the greater Postgres community stuff works well enough that we've been able to spend time on, on other items, well, but it, it's something it, that we're it, recognizing needs to be done. And you just hit a point, which I was going to make to, to answer Lynn's question. So Lynn asked a really good question, like, hey, I've got this development team, you know, I'm interested in introducing Cockroach, you know, what are the kinds of things we need to think about, or I need to think about before going and promoting Cockroach as a potential option. And, and that was the, the point actually I was going to make is that, you know, if it hadn't been clear before, you know, Cockroach implements the Postgres wire protocol from a SQL. I mean, we've been talking all day today about infrastructure and how we deploy in Kubernetes, but at the, you know, the interaction between uh, an application developer and Cockroach is SQL. It, it's ANSI, you know, traditional SQL, we're a relational database. In fact, we implement the Postgres wire protocol. So when you want to connect to Cockroach, you're simply using, uh, you know, whatever Postgres community drivers you have for your language. So this question about like, you know, how difficult is it to adopt Cockroach and how different might it be from some other things? The good news is, you know, Cockroach, unlike some other databases, is just using traditional SQL. We're not asking you to learn some newfangled, you know, SQL in order to interact with Cockroach or some newfangled API. You know, if you've ever used Postgres, which you mentioned, Cockroach is going to slot right in. Obviously, behind the scenes, it's a very different animal for lots of good reasons that are probably beyond the scope of this call. But, you know, what, what we're finding when, when introducing Cockroach to development teams is if they are familiar with SQL, MySQL even, but certainly Postgres SQL, uh, and they're used to building apps, you know, with that language in mind, the transition to Cockroach is a very simple one from a, you know, kind of like a philosophical perspective. Yeah, the, I would say the easy stuff is easy, right? Yeah. Some of the more challenging stuff, you have to think specifically about how to do it in Cockroach TV, but yep. the easy stuff is easy. Our, not only are we the Postgres wire protocol, but um, whenever, wherever possible, we try to implement the Postgres syntax for our SQL statements, right? So yep. um, we have a, a great page on the docs to plug the docs again, uh, describing exactly where the SQL compatibility um, matches up with kind of vanilla Postgres. Um, it's not hundred percent, right? It's like 80 something percent. Um, there's some very good reasons why it's not hundred percent, right? Um, yep. to, to Jim's point from earlier, we, we do have to pay a little bit more attention to the physical model, right? Go, I had to dust off at least one of my like data modeling books from my, my days in college. Cause I hadn't thought about physical data model in a really long time before I joined here, but it is something that you know, we have to pay attention to that we didn't have to pay attention to for a long time and other types of systems because, you know, it was a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship and now that's not where we're at. Yep. But, um, but there's a, you know, a high level of, of compatibility there. And even where there needs to be changes, I think a great example is um, like in, um, in like the spring community, there are, there are cockroach DB variants for things like hibernate, right? Mm -hmm. um, that implement those changes so that you can even have that like OLE, um, you know, that that um, that kind of higher level like developer ORM, ORM yep. like engagement model with the database and, and have it work nicely with Cockroach DB. Hopefully that answers Lynn's question. It did. And then there was a, you know, there's been, I've been answering a lot of questions obviously in, in the Q and A and it's, it's come up a few times about, hey, can you compare to this, compare to that? Lynn, who's on fire today, again, Lynn, great job uh, <laughs> asking all these questions, but, you know, asking kind of a comparison to, to both Spanner and, um, and Cosmo. And obviously we're not going to get into a detailed comparison. We just don't have time. Uh, but, you know, but I, I think one of the things I might point out, and we're seeing this over and over again, is that, and, and in part, the reason why Kubernetes is so attractive um, to, to us and OpenShift and Red Hat is that we're seeing a ton of interest in running CockroachDB in kind of 
you know, hybrid environments, multi-cloud environments, all sorts of interesting kind of infrastructures and topologies. And so I think, you know, maybe as much as all the other things that we could talk about in terms of like technical and architectural differences between things like Cosmos and Spanner, one of the key things that are driving people in the cockroach direction is this idea that, hey, I could, I could run a cockroach cluster that spans multiple cloud providers simultaneously or on-prem and multiple cloud providers. And certainly OpenShift with some of the technologies you mentioned can really drive that. But I think, you know, maybe before we get into all the other stuff in a later conversation, that's an important thing to consider is that it just that ability to run or, or you know, run anywhere really. Yeah, the, the, the one thing I'll add to that is that we are designed for system of cloud native system of record workloads. So Cosmos DB is, is not, you don't have the same consistency guarantees there with, um, with any of their multi-model interfaces. They're less, give less, lower consistency guarantee. Spanner has, um, has the same types of consistency guarantees. We're, we're based off the Spanner paper. Um, they have a very specific hardware requirement. They use atomic clocks. Literally, they have little atomic clocks in their data centers to do very tight clock synchronization. And um, we, have, we have found a way to, to live without, to, to give that same kind of functionality without having atomic clocks. Right. And, and that- we have a great 27 million word blog post on the topic. I was going to say, there is a great blog post there. 27 million words. Living without atomic clocks. Go yeah, look so, it up on our blog. So you guys, thank you. And, and Tim, thank you for ending on that particular topic. I think that's one of the most interesting things about Cockroach. Like one single logical database running across different physical environments. That's cool. And, you know, I think that's one of those things. It's not easy, right? Like I, like, I don't think anybody is going to say that multi-cluster, or multi, even multi-region is not easy, right? Like, and I almost think like regions are different clouds sometimes, right? Because it, it, it's, it, these are, there's their complexities and there's complexities, especially when it comes to latency, especially when it comes to consistency of data. Um, and, and, and those are the things you gotta watch out for. And I think, you know, being cloud agnostic running anywhere, but being able to do this sort of thing, it just, you know, kudos to this entire engineering team and the founders. and. The entire architecture of this thing is just, it's its tremendous. When I saw this three years ago or whatever, I got like four or five years ago, I was like, well, that's what's gotta happen. You know, like we're, we're almost living in the future sometimes I feel like guys. And, and I think, you know, this, this is a really good example of really future facing stuff here. Uh, this entire webinar and, and, and everybody on like the, the, this involvement in Kubernetes just I, I find it to be a whole lot of fun. And, and, and like I said before, Keith, I'm so intrigued at where the community is going to solve all these things. Um, it's just, it's fun to be a part of it, so. Well, the, I, I will give a plug for next week's webinar because yeah. um, I believe that's the, the DoorDash conversation, yep, right? Yeah. Where, where we're, you're gonna be talking to a customer that literally had these problems, the types of problems that, that all of this stuff was designed to solve. Um, pretty sure they're running on Kubernetes. That's so right. I think you can definitely talk to them about why they picked Kubernetes there. Um, but it, it's really interesting to see what happens when things start to fall down in the cloud and how companies are, are choosing to solve these problems so that they don't have multi-hour outages and that, those kinds of things. That's right. Well, thanks again, Keith. And that's a really great ending because you just made me do what I was supposed to do and I didn't do it because the DoorDash one, I'm looking forward to that one. Sean's awesome. Like talk about a practitioner dealing with some awesome things. So um, thank you for that. Um, Tim, thank you for everything. Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, carefully curating all the questions and everything's awesome. And then Keith, as our chief Kubernetes officer, hats off to you, buddy. I mean, really. I so, appreciate I got promoted in the middle of a webinar. I say, is HR well, on email, let's get that promotion official. <laughs> job I guess you know so um no seriously guys thank you as always I love working with both of you uh and I will do it for years and years to come so um thank you everybody for joining um I hope you enjoyed this uh, there is a survey that will pop up after this please do um fill that out we we are always looking at that we're always looking at ways to improve um any feedback or comments are just super super appreciated so um with that everybody have a great day and thanks for taking an hour out of your day uh, we'll get this recording up soon so Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Tim. We'll see you Bye guys. Bye now. Later. Bye.